Google Docs are slow, with internet being slow. All right. Well, while this is uh, thinking, let me introduce ourselves. We are the Latino Group, and our presentation today is called Nine Digits of Freedom and the Privileges of Having a Social Security Number. Even though 19% of Latinos in the United States are undocumented, this is a very strong association in our society uh, that we perceive that Latinos are all undocumented. So today, we'd like to uh, inform you a little bit more. Uh, my name is Ruchita Mahodama. I'm a sophomore in environmental science. I'm Vanessa McNeil. I'm a sophomore in Child Adult and Family Services. I'm Key Nelson. I'm a senior in criminal justice and sociology. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Max Wood, and I'm a sophomore in material science and engineering. Okay. Our first slide, we're going to talk about language because as a group we decided that language is very important because we want to effectively communicate with you all. So it's important to, to define these words. Um, the first word is citizen, and that means uh, an a citizen is a legally recognized individual. And that goes into the next word, document. <coughs> a citizen will have documentation, that means an original official, official paper proving one's legal rights. The next word is undocumented. Undocumented is lacking the legal rights to reside, work, and to utilize the resources in the host country. The last word is naturalization, and that is a pr formal process that an individual has to go through to become a citizen of the United States. And there are three ways to become a US citizen. The first one is to be born here. Um, the second one is to be naturalized after residing in the United States for five years. And the third way is to, on your 18th birthday, you'll be considered a citizen if your parents have become naturalized. Um, another way to get a social security number is the false identification disclaimer. So that is the language that we'll use today. I'm not done. Okay. okay. Um, Privilege is the basis of our research. We want to educate you all about what privilege is and how it works in our everyday lives, especially Latinos. Um, privilege is a special right, benefit, advantage, or immunity granted to a certain group of people. In this case, it will be the <coughs> documented individuals. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to let it load, sorry. Oh, it's, it's freezing. <laughs> um, privilege comes in many ways, shapes, and forms, and is deeply um, embedded in our lives that most of the time we don't even realize that we have a privilege waking up this morning and knowing that, or not having the fear of being deported is a privilege. Having legs to walk is a privilege. Having food to eat is a privilege as well. Um, other examples of privilege are heterosexual white males, if you can own a car, and if you're able to walk. So I have a little video clip to show you guys. That is slowly loading, so uh, <coughs> should we just skip that for now until it's... Uh, sure. Or, nope, didn't want to, oh wait, here it is. And it's actually loaded, but there's no sound. <laughs> Unless your ancestors lived on this land before Columbus came to the Americas, stop listen. Borders are simply drawn by politicians and government. But as Latinos, we know that America is as much of our land as any other person living here now. How did you get here? What is your immigration story? What has your family contributed? Latinos contribute millions of dollars in tax revenue each year. Whether we have been recognized as legal citizens or not, we are willing to take the lowest paying and highest risk jobs. If 
refuse to do. We believe strongly in the importance of family. We are religious. We obey a lot. And we are human beings that make mistakes. Some of us are legally recognized. While others can't afford the legal cost of citizenship. We are not going away. We are here to stay. We will not be here if we do not believe in the American dream. We are learning to speak English. We are sending our children to school. We want what you want. But we are not here to take your dreams away. We are here to make our dreams better. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about systematic privilege that we've had in um, the United States within its immigration law and why and how that has resulted in some disenfranchisement of groups that we have today. And hopefully I'll be getting into how we see similar laws coming about today that are creating similar disenfranchisement to what we had centuries ago. So we're going to start way, way back when, before the Civil War, to the first bit of when we were starting to talk about what it meant to be a U.S. citizen. Um, the Dred Scott versus Sanford, uh, Sanford case, which was a 7 to 9, um, or 7 to 2, not 7 to 9, 7 to 2 Supreme Court case that stated that freed slaves in the United States were not to be considered citizens of the United States. Um, it said basically if you were black, you, did, you were not a citizen. And this eventually was overturned by the 14th Amendment um, in 1868. But I mean, this is something that in the past we've seen being the United States as being white. And slowly, there's been progression towards this. And here we have the um, section one of the Fourteenth Amendment. I'll let you read that under later. Go to the next slide. All right. So some major laws in the immig uh, on immigration in the twentieth century. We had the Immigration Act of February fifth, nineteen seventeen, which essentially, in all of these, started to try to exclude and make it harder to come here. Um, it excluded people who were illiterate. Um, it excluded people who had mental health. Um, it banned Asian zones from coming to the United States, uh, or actually not coming from the United States, becoming documented citizens. Because I should mention that during this time, people were coming into the United States, they were just not becoming citizens. Um, and that has a whole host of privileges that come along with it, being able to vote, being able to do a ton of different things. Um, then there's the quota law of May 19, 1921, which was the first law to start setting quotas on how many people we were going to let in. And, citizens. Uh, it set the quota to be 3% of the nation nationality breakdown from 1910. So essentially <coughs> that's saying we don't want our population to change. Uh, the amount of nationality and the ethnic makeup from 1910, we're going to allow 3% of what we had then in 1921, and we're going to continue that. Uh, they, however, do allow <coughs> actors, artists, um, professors, and anybody who they deem to have a professional degree um, to become citizens without question, no matter what ethnicity. Um, the Immigration Act of May 1924, or May uh, 26, 1924, even further um, uh, did this when it sent the nationality back to 1890, so when the population was even more um, homogenous and more Euro Eurocentric, and it said only 2% of each nationality. So if you were from London, or if you were from England, or um, if you were of Dutch background, or some of the major um, countries that came in in the early days of settling, settling, uh, they were you were allowed to come in to become citizens, but if you were not, then you were not apt to be a citizen. Here I have a cartoon from the time period um, that's kind of making fun of this, and it, there was debate at the time: should we be doing this? Like, is it fair for us to just to come over and be like, all right, now we're not letting any black or Asian or Central American, Spani no Spanish, none of these people are going to be. And it says throwing down the ladder by which they rose. Um, the Immigration Act of uh, 1950 or 52 started to go in the right direction. Um, it tried to eliminate um, gender discrimination and it eliminated race as a factor for immigrants. So it wasn't until 1952 that race was no longer being taken into place for who we allowed to become uh, citizens. She also mentioned in 24 they started making people have visas to be to even come into the country. So before that, you could come in and you were not necessarily uh, a citizen, but you were still in the country. In 1924, they started um, not allowing anybody in unless you had a visa. Um, 
1952, it changed the national requirement from being based on nationality to having a minimum of 100 people per country, so they started moving more progressive. And, uh, but however, there was still a maximum cap placed on uh, most Asian countries of 2,000. So they still were not allowing um, immigration from all countries, and that was done mainly for a communist threat. I mean, here is another cartoon from the 20s depicting what the general theme and general idea of what immigration to the United States was. And it's, I think if you read it, it says no oppression, no oppression, no taxes, no expensive kings, um, no military, no knockouts. And it's showing like all this awesome stuff. But if you look at the population that they are depicting as what, who we are allowing, who we want to come, it's all predominantly white. Uh, Nineteen sixty five was seen as highly progressive and it eliminated national origin. Um, it gave visas and a first come first served basis, and there's actually a huge influx of immigration after this. Um, in nineteen eighty, the Refugee Act, refugees were taken off the um, list of priorities or prioritized people that they allow, and they were just said like we don't limit the number of refugees or no, they said yeah, they don't limit the maximum number of refugees that come into the country. And then the immigration reform in 1986 was interesting because it actually provided amnesty um, in the U.S. to anybody who was here before 1982 and undocumented. Uh, and it made more strict uh, punishments for employers who knowingly hired undocumented immigrants and increased the funding for U.S. border security. And all, all throughout this, we, we can see this general legislation has slowly been breaking down, but um, from the start, it's always been a, we want our people, we want America to stay American or white. Um, and there's been a lot of systematic privilege to being able to call yourself a citizen and like wealth being able to accumulate generation after generation um, coming down because you um, came here first and you were able to take advantage of governmental programs first. Here is a current cartoon that depicts some of this um, sentiment mentality of um, uh, immigration in the United States. And I think it's interesting because it's I draw a lot, drew a lot of conclusions to the one we saw about knocking the ladder down on the wall, um, and how people feel that their country, their country, is being invaded um, the same way as a war. For the next one, uh, here I have some quick statistical data on the changing demographics of who has been coming into this country from their national origin. Um, we see in the 19, 1900s to 1910, predominantly European, 91%. And as we go through, slowly it starts to change and more and more people from Central America are allowed to um, immigrate. And it, it, yeah, it just slowly breaks down and goes to the next one, cuts off the bottom. And here we have all the way to 1991 to 1997. Um. Okay, I'm gonna talk about social privileges of being a citizen of the United States. The first one is having an active voice in the community. If you're a citizen, you're gonna be more secure stomping and yelling and screaming at the White House and voicing your opinions um, because you're not going to have that fear of deportation or getting caught by law enforcement. Um, if you're a citizen, you're going to have generally, you're going to have less pressure to assimilate because you are part of the whole, you're a part of the normal, the majority. Um, as a citizen, you're going to have less perceived immigration status. Um, you're probably gonna have the luxury of not being stopped by, or looks have looks on suspicion or be investigated because of the way you look due to your social status. Um, status determines the ability to prosper in many domains and social privilege was the first that I touched on. Next slide. Okay, legal privileges of citizenship. The first is having a social security number, which brings you to have a lot of privileges, like you need your driver's, you need your social security number to get your driver's license, to 
get a work permit, um, to apply for a lot of things. So that's the first privilege of being a citizen. The second one is you don't have to go through the naturalization process, which is very long. It's, it's time consuming, it is expensive, um, it's extensive as well. You have to learn the history of the United States and um, the presidents um, as well. You have to show that you can read and write English, and you also have to have or demonstrate good moral character. The next legal privilege of being a citizenship, you'll be eligible for financial assistance, uh, notably financial aid that's um, financial aid and grants and college scholarships that are only offered to people that are US citizens, so that's a huge privilege as well. Um, if you're a citizen, you'll have the privilege of benefiting from Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, if you are, if you're not a citizen, you still have to pay those taxes. But if you're, you, you are a citizen, you'll have hope that either you or your dependents will benefit from those. Lastly, another legal privilege um, is freedom of speech, religion, and press. So you'll be able to benefit from those first 10 amendments and all of the other legal <coughs> privileges in the system. There's many questions about why people would want to become a US citizen. And the first social privilege is you're gonna have a general sense of belonging. If you're living here and you're not a citizen, you're, you're gonna feel like the other and you're not gonna feel like you belong. So having that citizenship will will help us help that as well um, there's economic increased economic well-being that comes along with citizenship studies show that children that children of legalized parents have higher economic well-being they're exposed to better schools and they have uh, increased opportunities Legalization ensures stable working conditions that boosts wages and provides work through means other than social contracts, and citizens are less likely to be exploited in the workforce. Another social privilege of becoming a U.S. citizen, um, it'll ensure that you'll have mental health care because a lot of times individuals <coughs> come to the United States, or if they're here and they're not documented, they suffer uh, adverse psychological consequences. So if you're documented, you're gonna feel more comfortable going to a mental health facility and letting them know your problems. So, um, The legal privileges of becoming a US citizen you're gonna be legally recognized, and that's extremely important. You're gonna have a right to a valid social security card, so you'll be able to get your driver's license and apply for jobs. You're gonna be eligible to vote in national, state, and local elections. If you, uh, another a huge factor that individuals wanna become a citizen is because they can sponsor their relatives to come to the United States so they can bring that family back together. Um, they're entitled to emergency medical care and health insurance. They're allowed to participate in federal jury. They're eligible for being in the US Army and they're also eligible to apply for entitlement programs such as food stamps, um, food stamps, medical, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and employment compensation. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about the education issues of, in the Latino uh, community. Uh, because the Latino community is the largest growing, fastest growing community in the United States, and they do have the highest dropout rates. This is why education is such an important topic. So I want you to imagine that you're a three year old toddler. This bear with me. You're a three year old toddler, and you're a child of two immigrant parents, and they're coming to the United States. All right? And they don't have the right documents to be considered. <coughs>